Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson number 159, uh, we will continue our journey in architecture styles by taking a look at the modular monolith. You can get a listing of all of the lessons I do on my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons. In the prior lesson, we took a look at all this kind of categorization or classification of architecture styles. And we took a look at the layered architecture. Well, in this lesson, we're going to kind of still be within the monolithic architectures, but take a look at the modular monolith. So the modular monolith is basically and best can be best described as a single deployment unit, which means all of the code is deployed as a single unit of software, but with functionality grouped by domain area. And as you remember from the prior lesson with the layered architecture, that was functionality that was grouped by technical categories. And this we're kind of flipping it 90 degrees and actually grouping things by domain area. For example, uh, maybe this area of a modular monolith contains all of the functionality, including user interface all the way down through persistence for inventory management, for example. Uh, maybe this particular modular uh, module right here is payment and billing domain. And so you can see this kind of grouped by domain area. If we were to take a look at this in the code, uh, what we would find is that in our namespace or package structure or directory, uh, we would find that the highest level node actually describes the domain. Uh, whereas with the layered architecture, you know, we saw that that highest level node after, of course, com.myapp.whatever uh, was the layer, either business presentation and then everything following. And so it's a good way of thinking about the modular monolith from kind of an implementation perspective. Now I'm showing the modular monolith here uh, as one code base, but it doesn't have to be that way. Another option within this architecture is to have each of those domains as separate workspaces, even separate Git repositories uh, that are formed into, let's say, jar files, DLLs, packages, or gems. And now during deployment, all of this is brought together to be executed in one deployment unit. And these things could be managed by, let's say, uh, Java Modularity, Jigsaw, Penrose, uh, OSGI, although I hesitate to say that word, uh, Prism and .NET, all of these kind of frameworks as well to help manage uh, the deployment and testing of a modular monolith. And so here, whether it's a jar file, a DLL, or whatever kind of module, um, would still contain that same kind of domain, the inventory, maybe payment right here. So the modular monolith does have, like uh, the layered, some superpowers, and not surprisingly, uh, those really are based on, it's a fairly inexpensive architecture. So cost is good, five stars is good. Remember, one star is not so well supported. And of course, it's simplicity. Uh, so this is really good to use if we do have a lot of time and budget constraints, especially during the initial deployment of this. Uh, this is a fairly familiar architecture style and it's fairly simple. There's not a lot of moving parts in it. Another really good use case for when to use the modular monolith is if we have and also expect uh, most of our changes being domain based. Uh, I gave an example in the last lesson uh, where we talked about adding an expiration date to our wish list items. And you saw that that kind of domain change didn't work well in the layered architecture, but here, there's the area of change. And so I know exactly where to go to because this architecture style is delineated by domains. Also, it's good to use also if our teams are also divided into like agile teams or cross-functional teams uh, with specialization. Uh, I shouldn't say agile teams because unfortunately I have run across some Agile teams that are technically oriented. <laughs> uh, but if our teams are divided into cross-functional teams with specialization, uh, this works well uh, because that domain change can come to a single team and that single team can apply that change. Well, looks like a nice architecture, 
But there are times to avoid this architecture style. Given that it is a monolith, some of the operational aspects uh, still aren't well supported, but also that agility. Now, you'll have notice here, if we start to do a compare and contrast, that in the prior lesson with the layered architecture, these things were only one star. Um, we have added an extra star here um, to say uh, it is a little easier to maintain assuming most of our changes are from a domain standpoint. Uh, so we do have an extra star, but still, if we require that super fast time to market, uh, it's not a very good fit. But also, uh, if we find that most of our changes are technical in nature, and let me give you an example, we continually replace the user interface. Well, what that means is unfortunately, because it, that kind of change is technically oriented, this is going to impact every single aspect of this architecture. Or if I replace the database or constant database changes, uh, maybe it's changes to constant business rules. These are kind of things that are more lined, aligned with technical partitioning as opposed to a domain partitioned architecture such as this one. Um, but also, as you can see from the one star ratings, those times when we have to have really high levels of elasticity, scalability, or even fault tolerance. Uh, this is not a good fit. So you can see now the modular monolith and kind of all the summary uh, is a very popular architecture style. Uh, if you want to learn more about the modular monolith, you can, of course, go to our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture. But also, uh, one architect, Simon Brown, who lives in the UK, uh, has a lot of material uh, uh, that he's been focusing on uh, on the modular monolith. So uh, this has been Lesson 159, our second architecture style in our journey of all eight of them. And this has been the modular monolith. Uh, thanks for listening and stay tuned in two more weeks for our next lesson, number 160, where we'll take a look at the microkernel architecture style.